Hi, my name is Jennifer Johnson. I'm a physician in the Division of Infectious Disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, and we're going to talk about infections, um, fever, and antibiotic use in the ICU. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, so as a way of some background for this particular topic, um, I uh, thought we would uh, cover a few points. Um, the first is that fever, as will come as no surprise to anyone, is a common phenomenon in the ICU. Um, the range uh, varies uh, significantly depending on clinical trials, but uh, estimates of around 30 to 72, or 30 to 70 percent of patients um, will have a at least one fever during a, a stay in the ICU. And the fever workup is challenging. Uh, there's a broad differential, and it's difficult sometimes to distinguish infectious versus non-infectious causes of fever. Um, fever in the ICU is also expensive. Um, there are estimates of a cost of a uh, course of um, ventilator-associated pneumonia or of bloodstream infections, um, other fever-associated phenomenons um, that you know, uh, range in the multi-thousand to $10,000 range um, per episode. Um, and determining when to give empiric antibiotics can also be difficult. Um, so just to cover a couple of uh, definitions uh, before we get into uh, the meat of the talk, um, we'll use a definition of fever for this topic, uh, for this talk as a core body temperature of greater than or equal to 38.3 degrees Celsius, um, which is the equivalent of 101 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, be mostly because that's the definition that's used in most uh, clinical trials. Um, and of high fever as a core body temperature of greater than or equal to 39.5 degrees Celsius, or 103.1 degrees Fahrenheit. A prolonged fever, as, de as defined in most clinical trials, is a fever lasting uh, at least uh, five days. And the gold standard for core temperature measurement is actually by a um, measurement through a pulmonary artery catheter, but of course that's um, fortunately not available for many patients in the ICU. So the other accurate ways that we use to measure temperature in the ICU include bladder catheters, esophageal probes, um, and rectal thermometers. And additional temperature measurement by um, tympanic membrane or temporal artery thermometers um, are, have been found to be less accurate. And of course, oral thermometers are oftentimes not uh, possible to use in the ICU due to intubation. So um, looking at the epidemiology of fever in the ICU, um, there are some studies looking at uh, what proportion of fevers are due to infection versus other causes. Um, and there's a wide variability across uh, studies, in part due to the variability in nature of uh, the makeup of different intensive care units. Some are medical ICUs only, some are surgical ICUs only, and some are combined medical surgical. And certainly the patient population uh, depends on the other services that are, may be available at each hospital. But the estimates range um, anywhere from a third to a half of fevers uh, that occur during uh, an ICU stay are due uh, to infections, or at least attributed to infections in uh, clinical trials. And fever alone uh, has been associated with an increase in mortality for patients who are uh, undergoing ICU stay during their hospitalization, um, increasing uh, the mortality anywhere from 10% to 35% above a baseline for other uh, patients who have a ICU stay that's not complicated by fever. Um, again, variable depending on the clinical trial. Um, and perhaps the, the most important point is that prolonged fever um, definitely seems to be associated with increased mortality when compared to a fever that lasts less than five days. Um, and this is a significant jump from approximately 63% uh, uh, um, uh, risk of mortality versus 30% uh, for a more shorter duration of fever. Um, there are other causes of elevated body temperature. So we do have the hyperthermia syndromes, um, which can be drug-induced um, endocrine uh, causes, including thyrotoxicosis, pheochromocytoma, or adrenal crisis, and environmental um, with heat stroke um, from you know, exposure at, you know, depending on the, the area, either just exposure to the environmental heat in a desert or hot area, or from um, excessive exercise causing both external and internal heat. Um, there, of course, infectious fever causes, which we'll go into more in a moment, and then the many causes of non-infectious fever, um, which uh, we'll talk about in a moment as well. Um, <clears throat> because of the challenges with uh, dealing with 
fevers in the ICU, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, together with the Infectious Disease Society of America, or the IDSA, um, put out a joint statement um, that said that, um, as a part of a, a publication, said that because fever can have many infectious and non-infectious etiologies, a new fever in a patient in the intensive care unit should trigger, trigger a careful clinical assessment rather than automatic orders for laboratory and radiographic tests. Um, and this is an important point in an age when we're trying to protocolize a lot of medicine um, that, you know, these, these events for patients, um, there's no easy way to just kind of have a checklist for uh, evaluation for fever. It really requires a comprehensive clinical evaluation of what's going on with the patient. So reviewing the fever curve and how that's evolved over time, reviewing the timing of um, recent procedures, um, reviewing any uh, symptoms um, that the patient may be reporting or things that may be noted by the, um, the nursing staff, um, and then doing a careful physical exam, especially if there's an operative site to be examined, um, and then reviewing recent labs for other trends. So the drug-induced hyperthermia syndromes, I'm going to go through this uh, um, a bit briefly. There's some additional information kind of listed on each of these, um, but these are uh, syndromes that cause uh, elevated body temperature, um, but, but that we wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, call uh, fever because of the um, set point, the hypothalamic set point. Um, so this, these include malignant hyperthermia, um, which is described as a rapid onset of muscle rigidity um, and acidosis. It's usually triggered by inhalational anesthetics um, and some of the paralytic agents. Um, and these have become more rare as, the, um, as we have uh, newer and better agents to use for um, anesthesia and paralysis. Um, then the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, this can be uh, something that's slower in onset, so that can make it a little bit more difficult to detect. Um, also characterized by muscle rigidity and often mental status changes. Um, and this one's usually related to the administration of neuroleptic agents. Um, again, has uh, becoming less common as we have newer and better um, neuropsychiatric medications. Uh, the serotonin syndrome, um, which is <coughs> a hyperthermia, um, characterized by hyperthermia and other signs of autonomic instability, um, that can also include altered mental status and um, neuromuscular rigidity, um, and can also be uh, fluctuations in uh, um, uh, heart rate and blood pressure, which can both be elevated. Um, and this is usually in patients who are taking serotonin reuptake inhibitors and often in um, taking serotonergic agents in combination um, or in combination with other um, uh, agents that may have serotonergic action or foods that may have serotonergic action. Um, adrenergic fever, um, this is, can be caused by um, some, some drugs, non-prescription drug ingestion, including amphetamines, MDMA, and cocaine, um, and then also prescription drugs such as MAOIs. And um, this, are, this is characterized by agitation and hyperthermia, and uh, it's typically treated with benzodiazepines. And then baclofen withdrawal, um, which uh, I think is probably not becoming less common and, and in some situations may be becoming um, more common as we can see um, some increased uh, use of baclofen by uh, alternative routes such as baclofen, uh, implantable baclofen pumps, intrathecal pumps. Um, so this is a, a syndrome that can occur one to three days after the discontinuation of baclofen and involves muscle spasms and hyperthermia. Um, and it's a good uh, reason to make sure that uh, People are always checking the patient's uh, pre-existing home medication list on admission so that uh, a medication like baclofen doesn't get um, forgotten to be administered um, during, administered during a hospitalization if it is something the patient has been on at home. Um, some other non uh, non-infectious causes of, of fever rather than um, hyperthermia include um, drug-induced fevers. Apart from the hyperthermia syndromes, we do see fever um, caused by multiple other medications, um, often including antibiotics, actually. Um, transfusion reactions, um, which are usually easily temporally associated with the uh, trigger. Um, clot, so either DVT or PE or both. Um, a hematoma, especially if it's large, um, and especially if it's um, in the, uh, uh, within the skull, so in the brain space. Um, a calculus cholecystitis um, and pancreatitis, um, just due to inflammation. Uh, aspirate, aspiration pneumonitis, um, which can be without uh, bacterial uh, pneumonia, but just with a chemical pneumonitis. Um, stroke and uh, myocardial infarction can sometimes cause low-grade and brief fevers, um, but unless it's an uh, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, should not be a prolonged fevers. 
Um, neurogenic fever, which can be uh, caused either by um, changes in uh, the autonomic nervous system um, or specific to injury to the um, hypothalamus or um, uh, blood that's collecting within the, um, within the ventricles or within the um, brain parenchyma itself. Um, and then collagen vascular disease, diseases that may be present prior to um, come admin, uh, admission to the intensive care unit, um, malignancies, especially hematologic malignancies, uh, transplant rejection, um, which should be characterized also by dysfunction of the transplant organ, so it should be easier to identify. And then, of course, the catch-all phrase, um, post-operative fever. Um, so most clinical trials looking at uh, fever and looking at patients in the intensive care unit uh, will include a definition as a cause for fever as post-operative fever. Um, exactly how this is defined depends on the clinical trial. Um, so in, there's oftentimes a definition that, the, that this is what's the attributed um, cause for fever for patients who have a isolated episode of fever um, within anywhere from 24 hours to four days postoperatively, depending on the clinical trial, um, that's not associated with any other clinical change um, and is transient and um, self-resolves, and that there's no you know, lack of other supporting evidence for uh, infection. Uh, so that may be called postoperative fever. The exact uh, mechanism of postoperative fever is not um, not definitely known, but the, certainly a cytokine release uh, post <coughs> um, stress insult, as as with a surgery, and even sometimes with a with a less invasive procedures um, such as uh, interventional radiology procedures. Certainly, uh, we do see sometimes uh, a post procedural fever as well. Um, so in terms of the infectious causes of fever, uh, we have some common and then some less common sites for, for fever. Um, so lower respiratory tract infections or pneumonias would be the, probably one of the more common um, sites for infection uh, and certainly uh, noted to be most common amongst clinical trials. And bloodstream infections uh, luckily are less frequently identified, but certainly can be more serious, um, even than the lower respiratory tract infections. Skin and soft tissue infections, which may be um, independent or may be associated with a operative site. Um, intra-abdominal infections, especially if there's been, uh, of course, if there's been an abdominal surgery. Um, an intraluminal infection of the gastrointestinal tract, um, so that would be uh, usually a Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. That's really refers to mainly a specific infection there. It's unusual for us to get other intraluminal infections um, within the ICU. Um, then operative site infection, which really varies depending on where the operative site is. Um, and then a catheter or prosthesis site, um, yeah, which also depends on where procedures have taken place. And then I put at the bottom a urinary tract infections and sinusitis. Um, I think there is a, um, a general approach to kind of try to use these as uh, explanation for fever pretty frequently for patients in the ICU. Um, but these are challenging diagnoses, and I'll get into this a little bit more um, in just a moment uh, as we come to those sites. Um, so again, the most common infection sites that we're concerned about um, in the ICU for bacterial infections would be lower respiratory tract uh, and the bloodstream infections. Um, so just a brief update on uh, lower respiratory tract infections. Um, there uh, was a paradigm shift in terms of our understanding and definitions and an approach to the evaluation and management of pneumonia, um, which happened just within the last year. Um, and so the, the major change I've just sort of shorthanded here, I did put a link at the bottom of the uh, slide here if you're interested in um, reading this article or getting more information on it. Um, but I've put in the what I think are the most critical bullet points for this update um, on this slide, which include the um, dissolution of the uh, category for healthcare associated pneumonia, um, which was previously um, something that had a pretty broad definition and in some instances ended up uh, as a catch all definition for many, many patients who are presenting to the hospital, which uh, led to many patients getting extremely broad antibiotics for empiric treatment for pneumonia because of being classified as healthcare associated. Um, 
And so the, the, with the change, we now have patients who are either have healthcare-associated pneumonia or hospital-acquired pneumonia, so pneumonia that is uh, diagnosed after the patient has been hospitalized for, um, for a, a, at least a couple of days, um, or a ventilator-associated pneumonia, so obviously a patient who is hospital, currently hospitalized and um, uh, already on the ventilator before the pneumonia is diagnosed. Um, so that's one of the big changes. And the other big change is a, a change to the recommendation, recommended duration of treatment, um, antibiotic treatment for different categories of pneumonia. So for um, community-acquired pneumonia, the new recommendation for um, duration of treatment with antibiotics is five days. Um, and that includes patients who are hospitalized with community-acquired pneumonia. And for hospital-associated pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia, the new recommendation for the duration of treatment is seven days. Um, and then there's also some newer evidence um, that's just been published last month that um, uh, even for patients with hospital-associated or ventilator-associated pneumonia, if there's any uncertainty about the diagnosis or if the patient rapidly improves um, or if there are any diagnostics that would suggest that um, pneumonia is either slightly less likely or less severe, um, such as a lower procalcitonin, which I'll get into in a moment, um, then uh, super or ultra short course antibiotics may uh, be sufficient and indeed beneficial in terms of uh, decreasing the risk of exposure to longer term antibiotics. Um, so in this study, um, patients received a first dose of antibiotics or first day of antibiotics, um, and then uh, sometimes uh, if it, and then if they were doing quite well um, on the following day, with uh, blood markers and clinical markers all uh, improved or or, or quite stable, um, the antibiotic course was truncated um, and may have ended after one um, or three days or somewhere in that range, um, depending on the patient. And talking a little bit more about lower respiratory tract infections, um, some of these definitions, which we've already mentioned, the hospital-acquired pneumonia and ventilator-associated pneumonia. And hospital-acquired pneumonia is, accounts for about 25% of all ICU infections in most clinical trials, and about um, <clears throat> at least 50% of antibiotics that are given in the ICU. Um, so it's a significant percentage. Um, about 10 to 25 patients of uh, a percent of intubated patients will develop a van associated pneumonia, and the risk is highest earlier in the course of the hospitalization. Um, and the attributed, attributable mortality to hospital acquired pneumonia is quite high, so um, between a third and 50 percent. So what are the organisms that we're worried about causing um, pneumonia, um, both in terms of uh, helping us understand the epidemiology and uh, helping us understand the pathophysiology and treatment for these um, diseases? So Streptomo certainly tops the list, especially for um, community-acquired pneumonia. And Staph aureus um, can be a problem both for community-acquired and hospital-acquired or been associated pneumonia. Uh, it always, this uh, inclusion of Staph aureus always brings up the question of whether or not uh, MRSA could be, uh, could be there. And certainly we would have concern for the possibility of methicillin-resistant Staph aureus if a patient is known to be colonized with um, MRSA or has had prior infection with MRSA or has a necrotizing pneumonia, which is often suggestive of MRSA infection, um, or a new ventilator requirement, so essentially has a severe pneumonia, which is so severe as to require the patient to be intubated and require uh, new initiation of mechanical ventilation, um, or a septic shock. Um, it is not necessarily the case that every patient um, with, uh, even with hospital-acquired pneumonia, uh, needs to be empirically treated for um, MRSA infection if they don't meet any of these uh, risk factors. Other bugs would include enteric gram-negative rods, especially in patients um, with ven-associated pneumonia uh, because of the possibility of aspiration. And then the non-enteric gram-negative rods, for example, Pseudomonas. Other examples would include Stenotrophomonas and Acinetobacter. Um, organisms that are not typical uh, gut colonizers um, for most uh, healthy people in the community, um, but are gram-negative organisms that can cause nosocomial infections, including pneumonia um, or even uh, bloodstream infections as well. And concern for these multidrug resistant organisms should be raised if a patient has underlying structural lung disease or prior colonization or infection um, or immune deficiency by almost any mechanism. And then certainly uh, the category that we often uh, brush over in terms of 
uh, etiologic agents for pneumonia is viral. Uh, and recent studies have suggested that a large percentage, a much larger piece of the pie in terms of a percentage of, uh, of pneumonia, etiologic agents for pneumonia is probably made up by many different viruses, including influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, para-influenza, um, and uh, many more human metanumovirus, and uh, many other um, potential viral causes of pneumonia. Um, so some studies using um, rapid diagnostic tests have suggested that, the, that at least a third of pneumonias um, for community dwellers may actually be viral, um, and so we, we may be over-antibiosing um, many of our hospitalized patients, or many of our patients that are diagnosed with pneumonia. So this is just a, to give you a clip from the new guidelines. It's a bit dense on the slide, um, and the reason that I put it in there is just basically to explain that it's probably a bit more than we can go over in detail um, verbally at the moment during this talk, but feel free to use this slide as a reference, or again, to reference this paper with the new uh, guidelines in terms of academic or, uh, antibiotic treatment, um, which the, the citation is given below. Um, but the, <clears throat> the idea here is that um, the, the column on the left is antibiotic, empiric antibiotic choices that we might use for patients who are not particularly at high risk of mortality and don't have any of the risk factors we talked about for increased likelihood of MRSA. Um, so you might treat them with one of the following agents, piperacillin and tazobactam, cefepime, um, or levofloxacin, um, <clears throat> with potential for use of imipenem or mirapenem if there's any particular concern for increased risk of multidrug resistant organisms. Um, and then the other two categories are essentially um, not, uh, also not at high risk of mortality, so not having septic shock or new initiation of mechanical and ventilation, um, but does have risk factor for MRSA, essentially similar drugs with the addition of a agent specifically to treat MRSA, such as vancomycin or linezolid. Um, and then the final category is uh, high risk of mortality um, or patients who have received ant intravenous antibiotics during the prior uh, 90 days, which might make us con concerned about the possibility of resistant organisms. Um, for VAP, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, um, the uh, suggested empiric treatment guidelines um, include um, a recommendation to choose one drug from column A, um, one from column B, and one from column C. Um, so the first category would be um, choosing a drug that treats MRSA, so either vancomycin or linazolid, choosing a gram-negative um, agent that is a beta-lactam, um, so there's a list available here, and then finally, um, choosing a non-beta-lactam-based agent, such as a fluoroquinolone alone, aminoglycoside, or polymyxin. Um, and the rationale for that is that um, antibiotic resistant mechanisms happen by various different pathways. Um, and so if a patient is doing poorly, you will increase your uh, likelihood of treating um, uh, uh, potentially resistant organisms by uh, using uh, antibiotics from two different antibiotic families, such as the beta-lactams, um, which are critically important for um, most gram-negative infections, and also um, something from another antibiotic family uh, that could uh, potentially treat some beta-lactam resistant organisms. In terms of uh, evaluation and diagnosis for hospital-acquired or ventilator-associated pneumonia, the clinical evaluation is similar to evaluation for all other infections, um, including a physical exam, examining the fever curve, um, and then in particular paying attention to the ventilator settings and how the, what the requirements for mechanical ventilation, how they have evolved over the recent past as a patient has developed a su suspected ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, the ventilator settings and the respiratory status um, are the most specific clinical uh, findings to correlate with ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, leukocytosis, fever, and even chest x-ray findings, and even lower respiratory tract cultures because of the possibility of colonization are all potentially nonspecific findings. Um, and so they are pieces of information that should be gathered because especially taken all together, um, if they're all suggestive, that certainly does build a better case for ventilator-associated pneumonia. But the vent settings are, are um, really one of the key components of this and probably the first place to look. Um, some organisms, when we do the respiratory tract culture, almost never cause pneumonia, and those include enterococci, the viridins group, streptococci, um, or uh, also known as um, alpha hemolytic strep, 
um, coagulase negative staphylococci and candida. Um, any of these certainly can cause infection within the pleural space or operative space if it's a patient who's had surgery to the chest space um, or lungs specifically or has something like a bronchopleural fistula, um, but they're not uh, known to uh, be frequent or sometimes in the case of candida even ever um, the cause of parenchymal pneumonia. Um, it's always helpful to make sure that the lower respiratory tract cult, uh, sample um, does represent a, a deep sample um, when we're sending it for culture and um, to examine whether or not it's purulent. Um, and on, in studies, as I mentioned, unfortunately, the culture has a wide variability in terms of sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of venous associated pneumonia because of the possibility of colonization um, and of other causes for fever. So there really is no um, uh, easily attainable gold standard test for venous associated pneumonia that can be used in the intensive care unit. It is essentially a clinical diagnosis based on a number of different factors um, to be taken into consideration. And uh, this begs the question of how the procalcitonin level could fall into this uh, diagnostic um, pathway, and we'll talk more about procalcitonin in just a moment. Procalcitonin is a biomarker of infection. Um, it is a precursor to the horm hormone calcitonin, um, and it rises, it's been noted to rise um, in the bloodstream uh, at detect levels that we can detect in lab monitoring in response to pro-inflammatory states, um, particularly bacterial infection. So it rises similarly to other uh, inflammatory markers such as the CRP, um, but seems to be more closely associated with uh, bacterial infections um, than and uh, some other biomarkers um, and clo more closely associated with bacterial infections as opposed to viral infections or non-infectious causes of inflammation. Um, it's been shown in clinical trials to be a correlated, um, rises in procalcitonin have sh been shown to uh, be correlated with bacterial infections um, in patients with uh, presenting with suspected respiratory tract infections and with sepsis, um, presenting in multiple different settings, um, in the emergency department, um, in the intensive care unit, in hospitalized patients, and in ambulatory patients in urgent care centers. Um, and it's been used as an initial diagnostic um, in order to uh, think about uh, the initiation of antibiotics, especially for patients with respiratory tract infections, less so with sepsis. Um, but, uh, all, but in both settings, um, as a daily marker that can be tested and followed uh, and used in order to guide um, uh, de-escalation of antibiotics uh, over time if the level uh, drops quickly um, or drops below a certain level. Um, I've included a reference here of a nice review um, in open forum infectious diseases that was published um, within the last year um, that uh, talks a, a, quite a bit about procalcitonin um, and uh, the, reviews all of the data on this uh, biomarker um, in, in, a, in a nice format that's quite clinically useful. This is a slide that gives some uh, suggestions in terms of interpretation of abnormal procalcitonin levels. Um, I realize that it's a bit dense and the type um, font is small, so I'm just going to go over a couple of highlights here. Um, but this is a suggested algorithm for interpretation of procalcitonin um, in the first instance in uh, patient uh, instances of suspected bacterial sepsis, um, and in the second algorithm is instances of suspected respiratory tract infections. Um, and you can see that there's a different range for the test depending on the um, suspected uh, clinical syndrome, um, and whereas uh, we would be um, not worried about um, bacterial causes based on the procalcitonin alone um, with a level of less than 0.1 um, for patients that were concerned about the possibility of respiratory tract infections. Um, we would be um, uh, not worried about patients for the possibility of bacterial sepsis um, when levels are less than uh, 0 0.5. And then in parentheses you can see that there's um, suggestions for how to use a daily procalcitonin level um, in order to judge when uh, back to ongoing bacterial infection um, becomes less likely and in most cases this is when um, there's a, a decrease from the peak value of at least uh, 80 to 90 percent. Um, so th when 
the value is low or when it decreases quickly, um, the suggestion would be unless there are other clinical findings, um, certainly the procalcitonin is not a perfect test and it's certainly not a standalone diagnostic test, but it does again provide another um, piece of information that can be taken into consideration along with clinical uh, data and other laboratory tests in order to determine uh, appropriate use of antibiotics, uh, whether to or not to initiate antibiotics, and then at what point um, to consider stopping antibiotics. A couple of important caveats to this test. One is that the procalcitonin level can be um, uh, falsely low when tested early on in the evolution of infection. So, so antibiotics certainly should not be withheld uh, for patients who are strongly suspected to have infection um, on the basis of a low procalcitonin level alone, um, especially in the instance uh, consideration for sepsis and patients should be, receive antibiotics immediately and the procalcitonin could be um, used more as a, a test to guide antibiotic cessation. Um, and then the other point is that there are many patient populations that, um, in which the procalcitonin uh, measurement has not really been studied um, because they were often excluded from clinical trials. And that includes um, pregnant women um, and also patients with most forms of immune compromise. Um, so receiving can, uh, chemotherapy or uh, organ transplant recipients, um, these type of situations. So we just don't have the data to know really well how the procalcitonin should be interpreted in some of these patient populations, um, but this is uh, something with, that we're accumulating data for on a day-to-day -day basis, so we may have more in the future. Um, and then <clears throat> based on those levels, this is one suggested algorithm um, for um, use of the procalcitonin level in terms as an in initial diagnostic. So for instance, with a patient with suspected respiratory infection, um, if they're not critically ill and not severely immunocompromised with other um, infections, and the initial procalcitonin, if it's low, um, could strongly discourage um, patients from uh, providers from using antibiotics, um, but might uh, uh, prompt people to recheck the procalcitonin uh, six to 24 hours later to see if that was just uh, an er too early of a test that it was evolving over time. And certainly if it's elevated at that point, then antibiotics would be appropriate. And similarly for sepsis, um, we have a, well actually differently for sepsis, I apologize. Um, we actually wouldn't recommend delaying antibiotics based on waiting for a procalcitonin value, um, but a baseline could be helpful and that if the baseline is very low and another cause for um, you know, shock or hypotension or the clinical findings there is identified, then antibiotics could be quickly de-escalated. Um, and then with the daily procalcitonin, um, once the procalcitonin is less than or equal to 0.5 or has decreased by more than 80% from its peak, then that may be an appropriate time to discontinue antibiotics unless there are other concerning clinical findings that would suggest more antibiotics are necessary. And these are some, again, the outline of the limitations which we have talked about. Um, it's not a perfect test. Uh, there is always the possibility of false positives if patients have other sources of infection that are non, uh, I'm sorry, other sources of inflammation that are non-infectious, such as autoimmune disease or a recent surgery. Um, and false negatives certainly can occur, especially if it's early in the evolution of the test um, or potentially in some of these non-studied uh, patient populations which are listed here. Um, and and the bottom line is that the procalcitonin uh, value or result should never override clinical judgment, um, but again may provide an additional piece of in, uh, information that especially can be monitored over time uh, to uh, guide consideration for cessation of antibiotics. Okay, so moving on to bloodstream infections. Um, so we often use this um, abbreviation uh, CLABC or central line associated bloodstream infections. Um, there are a lot of uh, bloodstream infections, central line associated bloodstream infections um, each year in the U.S. So anywhere between 85,000 and 350,000 depending on the year um, and the data, um, which is sometimes difficult to get. Uh, the risk of bloodstream infections with the central venous catheter it was about two to five per thousand catheter days um, as compared with less than, which doesn't sound like a terrible number, but uh, this is compared with less than 0.1 per 1,000 catheter days for a peripheral IV. 
Um, so initial evaluation should include an examination of the um, insertion sites uh, daily, actually by nursing staff, and then certainly um, additionally by clinicians if there's concern for infection. And if the line isn't operating appropriately, um, especially if it doesn't, uh, especially if it doesn't flush, then that should raise some concern for um, clot or infection. Um, when acquiring blood cultures as a diagnostic test um, for bloodstream infection, technique is actually quite important, um, both to um, improve the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Um, and it's recommended to clean the uh, skin with a uh, chlorhexidine or iodine, um, to clean the bottle tops with alcohol, to draw 20 to 30 um, mLs of blood. So that's what, one reason we do try to um, check blood cultures only when needed. Um, and the optimal sets are, are the optimal results are when three to four sets are drawn within 24 hours of suspect onset of suspected bacteremia. Um, but that's a lot of blood um, in a short period of time, so we often don't quite get that many, and many times don't need it. Certainly, if the, t the blood cultures return positive. And it is helpful to have at least one blood culture drawn peripherally, um, it, even if uh, another set needs to be drawn off of an indwelling central line because of lack of peripheral um, uh, opportunity of veins for, for culture. Um, in general, uh, the uh, general recommendation is not to routinely culture um, removed central venous catheters uh, unless there was co particular concern for infection. Um, and there's a low rate of positive results overall of blood cultures amongst ICU patients. Many, many, many cultures are drawn, um, but only a, a scantly few turn positive. Um, but the risk of missing a diagnosis of a bloodstream infection is so high and potentially uh, could result in a potentially fatal error for the patient. Um, so we, we do uh, do a lot of testing, even though we have only a small percentage of positive results. So in terms of treatment, um, blood cultures are um, certainly more sensitive and specific for diagnosis of um, bloodstream infection than respiratory cultures are for diagnosis of uh, pneumonia. Um, and treatment can usually be directed by the culture results, um, but in terms of thinking about antibiotics for empiric treatment, um, we would always want to be empirically treating for um, the most likely organisms, which include Staph aureus, both methicillin susceptible and methicillin resistant, um, and coagulase negative staph. Um, those would probably be the top two, and then other possibilities are pretty variable, um, include strep species, um, gram-negative rods, including enterics and non-enterics, such as pseudomonas, and possibly even fungi, uh, especially candida, um, and potentially other more rare fungi, especially if patients are immunocompromised or recently transplant um, recipients. Um, line removal in the instance of bloodstream infection um, is certainly optimal for, from an infection perspective, but may, may not be always optimal for, in terms of the overall patient care, um, depending on what else is going on with the patient at that time. So there are some situations that we tried to get a bit more creative about um, uh, uh, bloodstream infection treatment. Okay, so moving on a bit, um, just to talk about um, urinary tract infections. Um, urinary tract infections are reported to be common in the ICUs, but there's no real consistent definition. Um, most studies equate isolation of a bacteria or yeast um, on a positive culture with infection, um, but we know that there's a high degree of colonization uh, with bacteria and, and or candida um, in both the bladder and certainly on the uh, urinary catheters and in the urinary catheter bags um, for patients who have indwelling catheters, um, including those patients in the ICU. So it's often difficult to tell if that uh, positive culture actually represents a true infection. Um, genuine urinary tract infections, um, at, especially as a cause of fever in the ICU, are probably uncommon, actually. Um, the chronic urinary catheters um, carry a high, uh, are associated with a high risk of patients having chronic pyuria, um, so having uh, increased white blood cells on the urinalysis, and also bacteria, um, <coughs> both actually, just by virtue of having the catheter in place. Um, routine evaluation of uh, urinalysis and culture in febrile ICU patients is of questionable benefit. Um, certainly patients with high risk of complication with UT UTIs, such as patients who are neutropenic or have urinary tract obstruction or pregnancy, um, should have testing. Um, but it maybe doesn't deserve the uh, high place in the initial fever evaluation that most clinicians seem to afford it. 
Um, one uh, possible way to decrease the, uh, the phenomenon of overdiagnosis of urinary tract infections in the ICU is to do a two-stage uh, process for your UTI diagnosis, um, initially sending a urinalysis with sediment um, and then only sending a urine culture for the same patient if the urinalysis um, shows some significant pyuria um, that's suggestive of infection um, and then um, checking a culture after that. Um, setting. Um, if, a, if a urine culture is going to be sent regardless, then making sure to send the urinalysis with sediment with it is, um, is quite helpful because bacteria in the absence of inflammation or in the absence of pyuria uh, is very unlikely to represent uh, an active infection. Okay. Um, other causes of uh, bacterial infectious causes of fever in the ICU um, include uh, infectious diarrhea, most commonly Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Um, and this is the most common cause of infectious diarrhea in hospital pati hospitalized patients, including those in the ICU. And these patients may present with fever um, and almost always present with leukocytosis um, if they ha don't have some other reason that they're unable to mount a leukocytosis, such a, as bone marrow failure in the setting of a, a hematologic malignancy or chemotherapy, um, and only rarely would have, uh, uh, be, have absent leukocytosis um, if, if, none, uh, if their bone marrow is working well, um, but does happen occasionally. Um, and then certainly with diarrhea, sometimes abdominal pain, sometimes nausea and vomiting, um, and certainly with uh, decreased appetite. A testing for this is done by uh, assays from the stool um, that may be toxin tests um, or toxin and antigen tests, um, typically by immunosorbent assay, so some sort of, some sort of EIA. Um, but rarely uh, done with a cytotoxicity assay where the stool is actually exposed to cells and culture um, to end the toxin um, from the uh, uh, Clostridium difficile in the stool sample can cause um, a, a result in a cytotoxic effect for the cultured cells and um, even uh, develop the development of pseudomembranes among cultured cells. If there's a high clinical suspicion for C. diff-associated infection, then um, uh, initial treatment uh, should be uh, initiated uh, while waiting the, the C. diff testing. And treatment for all patients with Clostridium difficile, um, as long as they're able to take oral medications, um, should be with oral vancomycin. Um, intravenous metronidazole is used only as an uh, adjunct to therapy for patients who have uh, more severe infection, uh, especially if there's a lack of gut motility um, or concern that the orally administered vancomycin may not uh, reach the uh, intraluminal area of infection. And that may also be an indication to consider rectal vancomycin, which is logistically quite difficult to give as given as a retention, uh, retention enema. Um, but can be uh, quite helpful for some patients. And then certainly for patients with quite severe C. diff, especially if they have uh, shock, um, then uh, their uh, surgical management or emergent surgical management, um, including the possibility of a colectomy, should be considered. Okay, what about other potential causes of bacterial infection in patients in the ICU? Could patients acquire bacterial um, meningitis while in the ICU? Should we be doing lumbar punctures on patients with uh, fever in the ICU who have an otherwise negative evaluation? Uh, probably not, um, unless the patients are neurosurgical patients, certainly, um, who are in the ICU with um, neurosurgical devices or recent surgery um, to access that space. So we don't have a ton of data on this, but um, the data that we do have suggests that um, nosocomial um, men bacterial meningitis uh, is probably not a uh, um, phenomenon that we need to be concerned about. This was a study of 70 patients in a surgical intensive care unit that was non neuro surgical, um, and uh, they found actually um, zero cases of bacterial meningitis in patients who had fever and even with a uh, finding of altered mental status. So lumbar puncture is not a part of the routine fever evaluation for patients in the intensive care unit. We reserve a CSF exam um, as a um, diagnostic test for patients with neurosurg neurosurgical history um, or those who are severely immunocompromised from advanced HIV infection um, or chemotherapy, stem cell transplant, et cetera. What about fungal infections? Um, these are usually nosocomial um, if the patient is immunocompetent. 
um, and include uh, invasive yeast infections as the most common group. Um, these are, uh, they may have an occult clinical focus um, that's difficult to, to diagnose, um, and potentially even negative blood cultures. In about one third of cases, um, we're unable to actually grow the yeast from uh, blood cultures. And risk factors for these include um, prolonged antibiotic administration, um, underlying medical comorbidities, invasive catheters, parenteral nutrition, hemodialysis, immunosuppressive therapy, and broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, the most common um, etiologic agent here certainly would be um, candida species. Um, mold infections um, with something like, for instance, aspergillus um, can often have a more of a subacute presentation um, and are much more common in patients who have underlying structural lung disease such as COPD um, and, um, and or are receiving corticosteroids. Um, do we need to do special diagnostics for patients that we're concerned about uh, uh, invasive fungal infections? Um, for the most part, um, the, the fungal isolator blood culture specific, as a specific test is not really necessary. Um, our most common fungal uh, etiologic agent for infection in the ICU is candida, and candida species grow pretty well in routine blood cultures, um, and the turnaround time with routine blood cultures as opposed to isolated isolator cultures is much quicker. Um, and so when evaluating for candidiasis, um, a test for routine blood cultures, and then possibly the use of serum fungal markers, such as the 1,3-beta deglucan testing, um, could be helpful. The beta deglucan is a, a component of the fungal cell wall of many different fungi, um, including candida and aspergillus. Um, and when it's detected in the bloodstream, can indicate an invasive infection with one of these organisms, especially if it's detected at a high level. Unfortunately, that test is um, certainly has imperfect sensitivity and has um, pretty low specificity um, and can be, uh, we see false positives in a number of situations, including administration of um, uh, medications or products that are filtered over cellulose membranes, such as intravenous albumin, um, and also uh, in patients who have exposure of gauze, which is primarily um, cellulose-based, um, into the intravascular space, so such as a large amount of gauze packing into an open abdomen during a time of surgery um, or something of that nature. Other serum fungal markers, such as uh, uh, galactomannan, which is a serum fungal marker for um, invasive aspergillus infections, um, the histoplasma antigen um, from the urine, most commonly used, um, the coxiella um, serology for um, cocci infection, um, it can be used for immunocompromised patients who have fever or the, cryptic, or the cryptococcal antigen. Um, but those, those uh, causes of infection, uh, those pathogens are so unlikely in patients who are immunocompetent that we rarely are ordering those um, tests for patients with normal immune systems. And then what about viral infections? So most viral infections are community acquired, um, such as the respiratory viruses that we uh, discussed, um, but may include uh, re nosocomial reactivation of latent infections, such as latent infections with um, herpes simplex. So we see patients reactivate with uh, gen genital herpes outbreaks or oral herpes outbreaks. Um, CMV, which certainly can reactivate, and um, we often uh, don't diagnose that because the diagnostic test there would be a PCR of CMV from the blood. Um, which is not a part of our routine fever evaluation. And if the patient is immune competent, so if they have a normal immune system, they will usually then um, clear that reactivated um, CMV viremia uh, spontaneously, um, usually before uh, we would get to the point of considering that as a, di as a um, potential diagnosis. Uh, that would change, of course, if the patient is a uh, transplant recipient or otherwise immunocompromised and a high risk for CMV infection. And then VZV, we certainly see patients have reactivation, um, varicella zoster um, with either dermatomal zoster or rarely even a disseminated zoster infection in the setting of uh, stress from uh, critical care um, uh, in intensive care stay during hospitalization. And, and HIV, um, you know, uh, because uh, we still do see patients with, um, who are coming into the hospital with undiagnosed HIV um, in, a, in the appropriate uh, patient setting, um, HIV as a potentially pre-existing but maybe not uh, previously diagnosed condition should be considered with, um, when other uh, causes for fever and infection uh, are exhausted.
And what about protozoal or parasitic infections? Um, these are kind of clinically fun um, to think about and diagnose, um, pretty rare, um, especially in the ICUs, um, so uncommon. But there certainly are some interesting syndromes that are worth at least knowing about. Um, both malaria and Babesia are intracellular or intraerythrocytes, so intracellular red blood cell parasite um, infections um, that could be associated with hemolytic anemia, um, sometimes other cytopenia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia and then fever um, and other complications including renal failure and sometimes ultramental status. Um, they may uh, be present as transfusion associated infections in um, areas where blood is not, uh, the blood supply is not screened um, for these potential parasites. And then um, anaplasmosis or ehrlichia, which is also an intracellular par parasite though of white blood cells, um, which can be also transfusion associated. And then uh, strongylates, which is an intraluminal uh, gut pathogen, um, uh, a protozoa, which can also be um, then as part, take part of its life cycle in the lungs, um, and is oftentimes a latent infection that is asymptomatic, but may develop into a hyperinfection syndrome in a patient who is, has had latent infection, um, often from exposure in an endemic area, and is then treated with um, immunosuppressive agents, especially including corticosteroids, um, and that can cause patients to actually develop a severe hyperinfection syndrome, um, which can be even complicated by shock in some cases. So unfortunately, um, all of these um, uh, patients in the ICU, we're see, we do see some uh, increase in the risk of some uh, bacteria that have developed antibiotic resistance. And there are contributing factors to the increase in, uh, um, in antibiotic use in the ICU. Um, one is that we have unstable patients, um, so they have, we have a low threshold to initiate therapy, and that's well deserved in most cases because we know that patients that don't receive correct um, empiric antibiotic therapy upfront have an increased risk of complications, including death. Um, and there's a pre-existing resistance amongst our bacteria population. Um, you know, each hospital has a different um, sort of antibiogram or panel of resistance that they may be dealing with in their community organisms, um, but pre-existing resistance certainly motivates the use of multiple agents. And then we have poor diagnostic tests. So as we discussed for both um, lower respiratory tract infections, especially for men-associated pneumonia, um, and then even for um, less severe and probably more rare uh, in the ICU, things such as urinary tract infections, we don't really have easy gold standard tests um, for these types of infections. And even our microbiologic data can be confusing because it may represent colonization rather than uh, infection. So this leads to a difficulty in terms of diagnosis, and sometimes we end up treating even when there's no proven infection. But even though we worry about these um, factors uh, increasing uh, antibiotic use, even to the point of overuse in intensive care units, we know that delays in appropriate antimicrobial therapy increases mortality. Um, so um, we saw um, patients uh, who were given appropriate antibiotics um, in one study had a decrease in mortality from 30% to less than 15%. Um, and then for, um, for patients with bloodstream infections, and then for patients with uh, lower respiratory tract infections, mortality increased, uh, decreased by a similar margin um, when given appropriate antibiotics. And this cycle of antibiotic uh, use and resistance um, is a difficult one to break in the ICUs. Um, as we alluded to, we have um, high prevalence of infections that may be with resistant organisms. So this leads to concern for inadequate treatment, um, which leads to the use of broad spectrum antibiotics, which leads to further selection pressure and then higher colonization with multidrug resistant pathogens. Um, so how to break from this cycle? Um, li limiting antibiotic use up front, especially when patients are sick or unstable, is very difficult and, and perhaps not uh, clinically appropriate, especially if patients are unstable, given the risk of um, mortality if uh, antibiotics, initial antibiotics are insufficient. But subsequent actions can make a really significant impact. So using cultures to guide um, antibiotics and appropriately narrowing uh, antibiotic regimens to treat only 
the uh, cultured or sp suspected organisms uh, can be quite helpful. Um, and then discontinuing antibiotics as non-infectious diagnoses become more likely um, also is quite helpful. And one key to this process of de-escalation and um, targeting antibiotics is remembering to discuss the antibiotics as a part of the patient's therapy every day, even if infection isn't their primary problem or the primary uh, focus of their ICU stay. Um, the antibiotics should always uh, kind of keep a, a, a place in the uh, sort of rounding process in the ICU and so that the um, antibiotic course uh, tailoring doesn't get forgotten uh, amongst all the other parts of the patient's care. And then also keeping the antibiotic short, courses as short as possible, for instance, using the new guidelines on treatment of um, hospital-associated and ventilator-associated pneumonia to treat only for seven days um, and making sure to set end dates and stick to them for antibiotics can be quite helpful. Every additional day on any antibiotics um, does uh, pose an increased risk for the patient for the development of things like C. diff-associated diarrhea and other antibiotic complications. So here's some take home points. We talked about that fever in the ICU is common and that the proportion of fever which is due to infection is variable um, but significant and likely around 50%. Um, the most common sites for infection that we're concerned about are lower respiratory tract infections, so, so uh, pneumonia, whether hospital acquired or men associated, um, and uh, uh, central line associated bloodstream infections. The initial fever workup should include um, a physical exam, a clinical evaluation, um, as well as blood cultures, a respiratory specimen culture, and chest x-ray. Uh, those, those can be difficult to interpret. And urine studies for patients um, for whom that's appropriate. Um, and if if, um, and the appropriate urine study initially may be only a urinalysis with sediment to determine if there's um, pyuria or inflammation, and that would guide um, subsequent testing by urine culture if, uh, if uh, pyuria is diagnosed. Um, if a bacterial infection is suspected, then empiric antibiotics um, should be initiated after cultures have been drawn with consideration for empiric tr treatment for drug-resistant organisms such as MRSA, pseudomonas, or other resistant gram-negatives. And broad empiric treatment is reasonable initiated initially, um, but antibiotic regimens should be tailored by culture data as soon as possible. And that there are many other non-infectious causes of um, infection in the ICU, um, and also infection ca infectious causes that are non-bacterial, such as candidiasis and viral infection. So having a broad differential and a broad evaluation is important. So um, I'm on to the review questions. So question one, this is a 52-year-old woman uh, with a history of depression, which is well controlled on citalopram, as well as a history of um, COPD, she's a current smoker, um, and she's hospitalized now with pneumonia. She requires mechanical ventilation for hypoxic respiratory failure. After intubation on admission, an endotracheal tube aspirate is sent for culture and grows MRSA. She is treated with linazolid. A radial artery catheter is placed for monitoring purposes. On hospital day five, she develops a temperature of 103.5 degrees Fahrenheit, as well as tachycardia and hypertension. Her ventilator requirements are unchanged. The most likely cause of fever in this patient is A, serotonin syndrome, B, ventilator-associated pneumonia, C, catheter-associated bloodstream infection with gram-negative organism, D, C. diff infection, or E, adrenal insufficiency. And the correct answer is A. Um, and the rationale for this is that um, the patient, um, just going through the wrong answers first, the patient does not have a clinical syndrome of uh, progressive ventilator-associated pneumonia. Her ventilator requirements have been unchanged. Um, and so that's suggestive that this is not a um, respiratory process that's causing this new fever. Um, Answer B is incorrect because catheter-associated bloodstream infections are incredibly uncommon with radial artery catheters, um, and so that's uh, less likely. Um, answer D uh, is incorrect because there's, we've not been given any clinical information to su suggest that this is an intraluminal GI infection such as C. diff. And uh, answer E is incorrect with adrenal insufficiency because the patient is um, both tachycardic and hypertensive, um, which would be um, uh, not associated with uh, intra 
adrenal insufficiency. The serotonin syndrome is correct because the patient has both the clinical syndrome, so she has hyperthermia as well as tachycardia and hypertension, um, as well as the risk factor. So she's been treated um, already with a serotonergic agent, that's citalopram, which is a pre-existing medication for her, and then the addition of linazolid, which is a, a weak um, non-reversible MAOI, I'm sorry, weak reversible MAOI inhibitor, which can cause um, also uh, um, uh, serotonergic effects, especially in combination with other serotonergic agents, um, and has been associated with uh, development of serotonin syndrome when given in combination with um, MAOIs or um, uh, serotonergic agents um, in, in a, a series of patients. Okay, and then this is question number two. Um, a 72-year-old man with underlying severe interstitial lung disease is hospitalized with hypoxic respiratory failure. Um, he requires mechanical ventilation in the ICU. He has a central venous catheter placed and receives empiric treatment uh, for pneumonia despite the absence of fever. On hospital day uh, number four, he develops a temperature of 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit. His physical exam is unchanged. Reasonable initial measures for evaluation would include all of the following except, um, and the answer possibilities are A, chest x-ray, B, blood cultures, two sets, one drawn peripherally and one from the indwelling central line, C, fungal isolator blood cultures, D, a culture of the endotracheal aspirate, um, or E, blood liver function tests. And the correct answer is C, fungal isolator blood cultures. So fever evaluation for a patient in the ICU who is developing a new fever, regardless of whether he's already been on to antibiotics um, for a, a, um, a current infection or not, um, should include blood cultures um, and lower respiratory tract cultures, um, such as the endotracheal aspirate and um, answer B, and the blood culture, or answer D, I'm sorry, and the blood cultures as an answer B, as well as a chest x-ray as an answer A, um, and then a panel of laboratory tests, including blood liver function tests, especially for patients who are on antibiotics, which can cause some um, drug toxicities, um, such as hepatitis, which can uh, be related to fever, um, or liver function tests can also be used as an initial diagnostic for um, a calculus cholecystitis um, or other non-infectious causes of fever. Okay, and then finally, question number three. A 64-year-old man uh, with a history of hepatocellular carcinoma is admitted um, to the hospital with upper GI bleeding. He develops hypotension and is admitted to the ICU for transfusions, um, pressors via central vena ca venous catheter, and supportive care. After several maneuvers, his GI bleeding stops. However, on hospital day number three, he develops a fever, a temperature of 102.2 Fahrenheit, and his blood pressure drops further. His pressure requirement increases. Empiric treatment with vancomycin, ceftazidime, and levofloxacin is initiated. On hospital day number four, blood cultures drawn the previous day are reported positive for MRSA. Appropriate next steps include all of the following except a, removal of the central venous catheter. B, repeat blood cultures. C, continuation of vancomycin for at least a 14-day course. D, continuation of ceftazidime and levofloxacin for a seven-day course. And E, transthoracic echocardiogram. Okay, so the correct answer is D. Um, so that those are uh, the correct. That is the correct answer because that is the um, not appropriate next steps to um, to take. So this was the accept question. Um, so why is it not appropriate to continue ceftazidime and levofloxacin? So this would be because um, we now have a, a culture that correlates with what's been going on clinically with the patient. So the patient's now been diagnosed with um, MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staph aureus bacteremia, um, which uh, correlates well uh, with his clinical syndrome of fever, hypotension, 
um, and his a pre-existing central venous catheter. So this is likely a central line associated bloodstream infection with MRSA. Um, now that we've diagnosed the organism, um, ceftazidime does not have any activity uh, against gram positive agents, including MRSA. And levofloxacin has um, uh, some intermittent activity against MRSA, but it certainly would not be the treatment of choice for a MRSA bloodstream infection. Um, so continuing either of those antibiotics would not be appropriate because of the additional exposure to antibiotics that the patient does not need. Um, the patient should be continue, continued on vancomycin. The current guidelines are to continue for a 14-day course for a MRSA bloodstream infection. Sort of depends on how quickly he clears his cultures, but that would be a reasonable estimate. Um, and then uh, repeat blood cultures um, should be performed to ensure that the, the bacteria is clearing from the bloodstream and that there's not an ongoing uh, persistent bacterial source. And the central venous catheter at some point should be removed when it's safe to do so um, because the presumption would be that the, the central venous catheter is also infected. And a transthoracic echocardiogram may be um, of limited utility since the patient developed this infection rapidly, um, but certainly uh, given the organism and the risk factor with a central venous catheter, um, uh, it would be reasonable to evaluate um, to make sure that there's not uh, an intracardiac uh, ongoing source of infection.